Welcome again to the Pan Am Post coverage of the Conservatives International Launch Conference. And once again, we have a fantastic guest, Daniel Hannan, a conservative uh, member of the European uh, Parliament, leading uh, Brexiteer and now also uh, founder of uh, Conservatives International. So, Daniel, could you uh, explain to us uh, what this is all about? Well, thanks for having me, uh, Daniel. It's always a pleasure to talk to the Pan Am Post. This is about trying to take the conservative message and the free market message to the places where the majority of human beings live and vote. Seventy percent right? uh, of people on this planet can't yet afford a washing machine. And yet we've been very, very slow at making an argument of popular conservatism that will appeal to that vast majority of human beings in terms that uh, will resonate with them, even though they will be the biggest beneficiaries of free markets and free trade. I mean, that, that is a, an observable fact now. If you compare the countries that have opened their markets in the developing world to those that have not, the biggest beneficiaries of free trade are poor people in poor countries, and the, the biggest opponents of it are the, the multinationals and the corporates who want to try and rig the rules. And uh, until we've understood that, and until we can broadcast that news, we're always going to be fighting at a disadvantage. You know, I mean, you, you cover it brilliantly in your, in your channel, how many notionally right-of-center parties in Latin America, indeed in, in all over the world, really don't think that you can win this argument. Deep down they think that if you're dealing with a uh, population with high levels of illiteracy that they will only respond to bribery, you know, and, and public work schemes and building a bridge here and so on. And so you have this kind of oligarchic conservatism, which of course never really wins. Uh, we should be offering something better. Then, um, when you think especially of, of the younger population in, in the age of uh, someone like Jeremy Corbyn or uh, Bernie Sanders, Podemos in, in Spain. Uh, how do you bring that message? With, and clearly, free markets work. They, they, yes, they I mean, I, it's really it's a good question. So I think all of those uh, people that you just mentioned, in a way, are a delayed response to the financial crisis of 2008. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, socialism looked as though it was completely finished. It was an ideology confined then just to a few lunatics on the very edge of politics. Uh, the, the basic socialist contention all the way through had been there isn't a free market, it's not meritocratic, it's all a racket, it's all just an excuse for the people who already have money to, to grind everybody else down. Uh, when we saw the reality of, of socialist regimes, we could see that actually they were more uh, oligarchic than anything. But after the financial crash, that Marxist analysis, for the first time in my life, began to look as though it had a kernel of truth because people could see that the bailouts had involved taking money through the tax system from low and medium income families in order to rescue some very wealthy bankers and bondholders from the consequences of their own mistakes. Now, of course, South America went through its leftist populist surge 10 years earlier. But I think the underlying reason was not so different. It was the idea that the capitalist system wasn't for everybody that it had turned into an oligarchy, into a cronyist system where the people already in power were able to entrench their position at the expense of everybody else. And if we're 100% honest with ourselves, there was some validity in, in that criticism in the 1990s. There had been a, a broad failure of parties that called themselves right of center parties around the region. And this is why we need to do better. Well, it's, it's since you mentioned that I was in, in Germany at the time of, of the crash and in my university in, in Berlin, um, this posters started to appear saying Marx was right. Yeah, uh, and, and it kind of looked that way. Didn't it? Right, and um, but but since Marx clearly wasn't right, and uh, what they're offering uh, can only lead to to, to a worse scenario and in the in the short term, as we're seeing now in in Venezuela. Um, how do you how do you counter that argument, especially in in the, in the developing world? Yeah, I mean you're right. Of course, Marx was well, Marx was wrong about everything. I mean, he wasn't just morally wrong, although you could argue that he was ultimately responsible for the ideology that killed 100 million human beings, which is kind of, that's a record that nobody else gets close to. But I mean, he was also just wrong in all the predictions he made. You know, the, the, uh, his basic contention was that the rich would get richer and the poor would get poorer. Just not true, right? The uh, capitalism has enlarged the middle class wherever it's been practiced and has raised the, the living standards of the poorest people. The reason that eventually it blows out whether it's Chavismo, with its regional variants of, of Morales, Correa, Ortega, whatever, or whether it's the Bernie Sanders, uh, Syriza, Podemos, and I would add Le Pen, Wilders, and so on uh, variant. The, the populists fail ultimately in their own terms because they cause the most 
impoverishment to the people who voted for them in the first place. In particular, economic protectionism, which always ends up with cartels and with raising prices, hits the poorest people because they have to spend the highest percentage of their income on buying basic commodities. So they're always the first victims. And you can see this obviously very vividly in, in Venezuela. It's, it's, uh, it started earlier, so the, the curve is more advanced there than in other places, You've, something similar in Greece. Uh, this now creates, if you like, an opening again for something different. And it would be tragic if we just came out with the same weak, traditional oligarchic conservatism that was corporatist and that was uh, genuinely was aligned with big banks and, and big business. Uh, I mean, I, I can remember traveling through these, these countries uh, at the height of Chavismo in the, the beginning of the, the 2000s and talking to the, what was left of the conservative opposition in some of them. And they hadn't begun to understand the depth of their challenge. They, they were still, basically, they still felt entitled. You know, the people that you would talk to, Everyone knows my surname. My grandfather was vice president. I'm white. There's a street named after me. The, you know, the, the statue with the, the general with the whiskers. He was my great, great, great grand. People will come to their senses. It, it doesn't work like that. You have to offer people uh, a popular conservatism based on opportunity, based on cheaper prices, based on anti-corruption, fewer government officials, more opportunity. People get that message. Even if they have limited education, everyone gets that more government officials means less opportunity for them. Right, and, and you have also uh, presented a case for, for Brexit, even during the referendum campaign, as precisely a, a mechanism for this new popular uh, conservatism on a global scale. Uh, could, could, could you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the paradox of our age is that people have never lived better, you know, on any indicator where we're better fed, we're better educated, and, uh, taller, <laughs> you can measure it in any way you want. And yet, in the developing and in the developed world, well-intentioned people, idealistic people are protesting trade agreements, uh, demonstrating against G20 summits, occupying stock exchanges, thinking that if you oppose free trade, you're standing up for the poor when of course it's exactly the other way around. So the challenge for us is to show the truth, which is that free markets are the best way to alleviate poverty and the best friend of the global poor. It works every time. Compare Venezuela to Chile, compare uh, you know, China to Hong Kong or to Taiwan. Uh, countries now that are doing it, uh, the, the growth rate in Bangladesh versus the growth rate in Pakistan because the one has properly opened to global markets, you know, uh, or in, uh, in Vietnam versus Burma. Of course, you know, there is always an aesthetic objection to these uh, development stories. And I, mean, I see it in my kids' homework, you know evil corporations that are making these Vietnamese women work long hours in shoe factories and so on. But there's something both, both racist and stupid about that criticism. Racist because it denies agency to the Vietnamese worker in the shoe factory. There's no analysis of why she might have wanted to leave a life of backbreaking toil in the paddy fields to come and work for twice or three times the, her previous income, which is, which is what it is, right? The, you're, you're much better off uh, financially as the employee of a foreign company in a country like that. Everything is our fault. Not, you know, the, the, the people there are assumed to be too stupid. Or whatever they do is just the result of us. But the, the, the real failure of that analysis, which is taught to every child and is the, the narrative all the way through in, in, in the Western world, is that the people in Vietnam or Bangladesh or whatever are being exploited and are being held down. When, of course, the reality is that the more we globalize, the more we open our markets, the more their productivity and their wages increase. And they understand that, even if the leftist establishment in the West doesn't understand it or affects not to understand it. And, and since since um, the, the system clearly works, and in, in a certain sense, uh, um, Great Britain, at least since Margaret Thatcher, has been a, a, an exporter of... of uh, of, of this free market system. Um, how true it is that uh, Thatcherism might be coming to an end, even within the Conservative Party, with uh, Theresa May making proposals like a cap on energy prices and, and uh, definitely taking a, a different line from what we've been become used to? I mean, I think, I think it, is, it is fair to say that uh, by the standards of where the debate is today, she is coming from the centre-left of the party on economic issues, not, not, uh, not on so much on cultural issues. I think that that's true. 
uh, the, the, the detail of the policy is not nearly as left-wing as the headline suggests. Uh, a lot of these are very mild changes when you look at them. And some of them, by the way, are, are, are perfectly reasonable. So uh, there were headlines about caps on, on uh, executive pay. But actually, when you look at the policy, it isn't that. It's about giving more power to shareholders uh, to set pay. In other words, encouraging the shareholders to behave more like owners and less like investors, which I think is a good thing. I mean, a conservative would be in favor of that, right? So, so it's not as, but I, nonetheless, it is probably true that this is not a, a, a it's certainly true that this is not a, a, a manifesto for further radical rolling back of state power. Having said that, there's a lot of things that were done by Margaret Thatcher 30 years ago that are now uncontentious. So although by the standards of where debate is now, you could say that this is a shift to the left. If you actually compare the policies to what Margaret Thatcher was proposing in 1979, this is well to the libertarian end of that because the center piece of uh, the, the center ground has moved, right. and things that were very contentious, like uh, lifting currency controls, nobody now argues about that. And. and uh what do you make of uh, recent polls that suggest that uh, Labour under Jeremy Corbyn has uh, cut the lead? Well, you see, the danger, Daniel, of doing a video like this is that uh, whatever I say, I can end up looking a complete idiot now to the person watching. Uh, <laughs> Not but I, I, I think, uh, look, I, I, if, if Theresa May doesn't win this election with a bigger majority, then I have badly misread the character of my fellow countrymen. And above all, it's because her chief opponent is he, he's not just a chavista i mean he was literally a chavista there's right, a right. there's a wonderful Basically, recording of him is. phoning in to maduro in, in spanish and saying you know you have the support of the pueblo de britanico and it, so it, it but, but it's worse than that he he regrets the outcome of the cold war mm -hmm. you know he again what i was saying about the the the, the passive racism of treating the vietnamese woman as, as a victim rather than as a, an agent who's made a rational decision He's like that with every terrorist group in the world. He cannot bring himself to apportion moral blame to the IRA or Hezbollah or Hamas or even Daesh because ultimately he thinks it's always the fault of Western foreign policy. And if someone like that can win a majority in the United Kingdom, then truly I don't know my country at all. Right, well, it's probably not a matter of him winning a majority, perhaps of the, of the lead or, or of there not being a landslide that was uh, one well uh, look uh, you know uh, to be honest I'm, I'm not wild about landslides ever uh, you, you need an opposition uh, to keep you on your toes and to work better uh, but what I think we're aiming for is a comfortable working majority that we don't have now uh, Theresa May has a majority of 10 uh, 10 in, in, a, in the British Parliament we have 650 something MPs that is a very fragile majority we have you know, obviously we, we have this big Brexit negotiation coming up. Uh, you don't want to be in a position where you are potentially held hostage by a small number of parliamentarians. So I think it's important that she get a mandate. Um, landslide, well, we all have our definition of what a landslide is. But I think if she increases her majority to a degree where she doesn't need to worry about getting the parliamentary business through on a day-to-day -day basis, she'll be satisfied with that. Right, and, uh, just to close, uh, uh, what is your appreciation of, of how she is carrying out the Brexit negotiations uh, up to date and well, I, of her approach in know, general? I think, I think she's very, very close to where public opinion is in the sense that she was a, herself a Remain voter. I mean, I know there is a sort of conspiracy theory that she was a Leaver all along. I know for a fact that that is not true because I know lots of people who tried to convince her uh, and failed. And she, and she argued very honestly and, and, and very straightforwardly in private, just as she did in public, that on balance she thought we should stay in it. She, she was not... Uh, uh, extreme about this, but uh, she thought it was a narrow call, but on balance we should stay in. Uh, she has, however, unhesitatingly accepted the result as a good Democrat. And she grasped that the worst possible thing would be to try to implement Brexit in a half-hearted way, in a sulky way, in a petulant way. That, that would be the worst, the worst than any, any other outcome. So she said to herself, look, if we're going to do this, let's do it properly and let's make a success of it. But, you know, she wants a good working relationship with our European allies. Of course she does. And, and, and so do almost all leave and remain voters, right? These are uh, uh, friendly countries. There are military allies. There are customers and our suppliers. Uh, uh, prosperous neighbors make 
better customers. Right? So we don't want to leave in a way that causes any damage to the economies of our immediate friends. Uh, we want this to be a success for them as well as for us. We want it to be a mutually advantageous process. But we also want to have the opportunity to have more open uh, trade deals and uh, broader cooperation with old friends and new allies uh, across the world. And here we are at the, uh, the Conservatives International Conference. I was talking to some friends from Argentina. Uh, we were Argentina's biggest market until we joined the EU. I mean, it's incredible. Not, not Brazil, not Chile. We were. You know, they, they sold all their meat, their wine and so on. And that, that uh, came to an end in 1973. It was disastrous for the Argentine economy and it, it contributed to the political instability of that country. There's absolutely no downside to either of us now if we can restore a genuinely open free trade agreement. You know? You know, of course we should. Well, it's absurd that we're paying tariffs on Argentine wine. Where, 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 is the, 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 where are the Malbec vineyards in the south of England that we're trying to protect, right? So, so this, the, the, there are opportunities here for everyone. If we can have a, a good trade deal with Mercosur, uh, it benefits everybody. The EU, for a whole bunch of reasons, is protectionist on agriculture, on, on industry, it has always been hesitant of doing that. Britain doesn't have that problem. And this can work to bring advantages on every continent. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you.